You're very welcome to the Baligar Carnival video on tracing your Baligar roots. I'd like to thank very much the organizers of Baligar Carnival on their 76th anniversary. And just like back in 1945, when they faced unprecedented events, especially in Europe today, we are facing unprecedented events throughout the world. So it's a great credit to them for keeping this going. And many thanks for having me here. My name is Martin Curley, and I'm a genealogist. I'm based in Mount Bellew, and I'm originally from Gilka in the parish of Mindla. My last few years have been working with schools and with community groups and with families and helping them to trace local history and also trace the history of their own families. So today I'm hoping to share with you some resources that will help out you in tracing your Ballygar roots. So very much a Cade Mila Falcha, two of those, the Branleys or Kellys or Clarks or Nolans or Martins or Lohans or Fallons or Hannans or Healy's or Keegan's or Kenny's or Smith are the various other names that form a part of the history of Ballygar and the surrounding areas. This uh, word cloud I used is from the 1855 uh, Griffiths valuation list of landholders in in the parish so your name is probably there if it's not highlighted large it's probably in the fine print and hopefully through this video will we get to see how to take that fine print and make it larger than life so Ballygar itself is a wonderful market town and it's situated on the crossroads going from Galway into Roscommon and going north-south from Banlasloe right up to Castle Ray. So it's a wonderful place. And I'm gonna just do a little quick survey of what it looked like back 200 years ago when some of the records that we'd be looking at were in place. So it's much smaller then. It was at the end of a long lane going into Ahernur Castle, which was the site of the O'Kellys. And the landlord there, Reverend Armstrong O'Kelly, had started off the town with a fair back in 1818, 1819. So it's just over 200 years old. So Ballygar has grown from then, but much of the town remains in place. So I'm gonna just go back to the very first detailed map, which is from the Bordnamona Irish Bogs historic maps from 1812. And you can see there that Ballygar as an entity didn't exist back then. So it was a few years later, just a decade later that it was going to be started. So Ballygar itself is situated on a piece of good land surrounded by great amount of bog land. The various townlands that you see around of Clune Line, Hermitage, Castle Kelly, Clune Ruff are still very much in existence today and Kilmore. And going further south, then we're going down into Caline, Baliban, and going down towards Mokina. So these are places that will come up, drying in there as well, will come up very much in Old Caloran Churchyard, which is now the graveyard. These will come up very much in your searches for family history around the area. I'm indebted to Paul Conley for his wonderful Facebook group our Facebook page rather, Mount Talbot, A Journey Through the Ages for amazing pictures that um, tell us vividly what Ballygar looked like in past years and the contributors that have given Paul such great images. And that website um, is, is a great one to just to look at some of the history and the places and the people of the area. So this is some of the volunteers from just over a hundred years ago who helped in the struggle for Irish independence. And also Paul has included lots of great pictures close up here of the town and what it looked like back in the day, the main street there. And the gentleman with his horse right up to the, um, the shop store. Another great Facebook group is the Friends of Ballygar. And one of its great contributors in the last um, while is Patrick S. Gilmer. 
um, Charlotte McDonough. And Charlotte has done an amazing job in reviving and telling the story of one of Ballygar's most famous sons, Patrick Sarsfield Gilmer, the start in a way of the modern band era with his big bands in America from the 1850s on. There's also Ballygar Banter that um, lots of people are involved in. And again, there's great local history and great stories involved there. And obviously as well, the Ballygar Carnival has a wonderful Facebook group as well. So Ballygar is well served on social media in terms of helping people out and finding their roots. What I'm gonna concentrate on this, this video is on a Facebook group of just dedicated to genealogy and DNA, the Balagar and Area DNA and Genealogy Facebook group. And that is something that I started back in 2017 as a result of a DNA project with the students at Kalosh Sawara. So the transition year group at that time got one of their parents or an older sibling to take a DNA test. And through that, we were able to reveal really strong ties throughout the diaspora. So I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that later on. So just to, to start then, um, people who are watching this video, most of you will have Balagar roots. Some of you will have roots in the immediate area or you'll be with ties in some way to Balagar. So you're more than welcome and I hope that this video will be of some help. So I want to begin with a picture of my own great grandmother. Her name was Nora Donlan, and Nora was from Lamona, which is down in Clanburn Parish. And Nora's story is fantastic, as I'm going to say with every family that have a history. Nora was born just before the Great Hunger in 1844, and she lived to be a grand old age of 103, dying in 1947. So many of you will have pictures or memories or stories passed on about people like Nora. And with each of those, it's important to record. Sometimes we can get a little bit flustered or a little bit confused about where exactly to go and how exactly to find those. So I'm hopefully going to be, going to be able to help you out with that and to show you some of the ways that we can do of recording the history. So the first thing, and my screen has frozen there, is just to give some guidelines and tips on how to research. And this is kind of like the very first step is to gather and collect names, stories, pictures and records. And who do you gather and collect from? Immediate family. Get as many people in the families involved. And not everybody, unfortunately, is into family history but many of them will have some memories or some information that they can pass on. Even if it's just one line, it can really open up the family history. So it's important to do that, to start with the people in the immediate family, if you know them, and to then extend it out to cousins and second cousins and so on as much as possible and neighbors as well to try and find out a little bit more about the family and the stories that are involved with them. And some of the neighbors as well might have pictures of the family because they would have attended weddings or some gatherings in their house and the, the neighbors would have come in, which would be your family, and they would have taken pictures. So have a look at that. And obviously we're going to be looking at some of the records today and trying to find some of them. This is from my own family. This is a, a wedding in the mid 1960s, my aunt, my uncle, and it's a wonderful example of where you have grandparents and aunts and uncles and relations all gathering together. And it's important at the back of pictures like these to put in who is who and to also say how they're connected and how they're related. And normally in pictures like this, families will stand in a group based upon the relationship with each other. The other important thing to do is then to record that and to make sure that it's done on a family tree through social media. And a lot of people now are sharing on WhatsApp or Facebook 
And those two are, are fantastic resources, but it's also important to make sure that you download those and to record them and to put them into a family tree. You might put it into a booklet or into a blog and just to have that shared within the immediate family or share it around with friends and family. This is a, a picture that was sent back home to Galway. Didn't know exactly who was in the picture. And it was in reaching out and sharing with family that I found out that it was my grandmother's brother, the son of Nora Donlan. This is Patrick Gormley. Patrick lived in Salem in Massachusetts where his, his family still have a connection to. And he was my grandmother's brother who immigrated as many of our families have people in the diaspora because of immigrants on our parents, grandparents, great grandparents side. So it's important to reach out to people and to find out a little about them as well through that. And those shares could be a family gathering where you have a wedding. Um, sadly, it, it comes up in funerals a lot where people are asked who, who are they connected to, but it would be much nicer if people would have a, a family gathering of their own to just share family connections. And the last few years I've been involved in helping out um, extended family gatherings like the Lohans of the area who came together in 2019 to reach out and to reconnect with each other. Also to be involved with local heritage groups. And also sometimes it would be good to share some of the stories and maybe some of the successes or some of the questions that you might have with local media. Um, our local media is very interested and very good at sharing that. The Tomb Herald, the Connor Tribune, Goa Bay FM, Midwest Radio, Roscommon People, and Roscommon Herald. So it'd be good to reach out to all of those. And when you do have your information, it's important to have it recorded. And what I suggest that while it's great to have it written down, sometimes that can get confusing for people. So it's much more important to go online and to find a good family tree program. And there are several available. My recommendation would be the one that's available through myheritage.com family tree builder. It gives you the opportunity to not just to collect your own information, but also to have charts and reports on that. And also you can share your family site with your own family that you can invite them to come and to see what you have collected and then they can share what they have as well. So that's important as you're starting off to just to start a family tree online, to share it with immediate family. You can set it to as much privacy as you wish yourself, but to have it for others as well that you can reach out to people, especially with Family Tree, the little green dots here on Family Tree, so that other people are researching these same people. And so therefore you can reach out to them and share what you have and they share with what they have as well. So I'm gonna just look at some of the resources that are available locally and especially um, the, the grave and obituaries and how they can help out with our family history research. Very lucky in Ballygar at the cemetery behind the church has been mapped and it's also online. And when you go there, you have the access and it tells you the, the number of the grave and then where the grave is located. And the graveyard itself is laid out wonderfully. So it's quite easy to find. So it's just at the back of the church, as you know. That then you can also go on to the Galway County Council website. So it's galwayco.ie forward slash graveyards. And that website gives you the ability to search the graves and you have a drop down menu with Ballygar and you put in your surname and you hit search. So I'm gonna do that with just one, which is the Clark surname. And when I click Ballygar and Clark, I get three hits. Some of them, it starts off with a different surname because the wife is going to be 
from the Clark family. And this is one of the older families in Ballygar, the Walls and the Clarks. And when you click on that, you come up with this image. And it tells you then where in the graveyard it is. And you'll be able to also say who is buried close to them, because that's important as well. Whoever is buried near enough in older graveyards usually has some family connection. In this case, with regard to burials in the 80s and in the 2020, um, both deceased there, Mark and his wife Mary, and God rest them on that, but that um, it would be probably different people on either side of them. But when you go back to much older graveyards, it will be closer family relations. Find a grave has the older Hiloran graveyard memorial. Some of them, there's 38 of them out of several hundred that are mapped there, but it might be of help for you. And sometimes the people who are adding and find a grave also add some relevant details. So for instance, Hugh Healy here tells us he's on Kilmore and when he passed away and where he passed away. And then deep regret by his sorrowing wife. And the person has also added on the wife's name. So she was Catherine Martin. So some of the information that you get on Find the Grave is going to be very, very helpful in terms of assisting you in your family research. Unfortunately, uh, Kiloran is not mapped in the same way as Baligares, but it's worth a trip there to see this fantastic gravesite. And prominent in it is the memorial to Dennis Kelly, who was the landlord in Castle Kelly. But also you've got some amazing architecture and also some wonderful headstones. So if you're lucky to be of the family of the Tansies of Coal Pits, you have pretty much your family history mapped out on one stone for you. So it's, it's fantastic work that the family has done on this to show each of the, the family names and where they came from and how they were connected to them. You also have some older headstones right beside some newer ones. So the Feeney family, some of the older headstones sometimes can be a bit hard to read. Um, I suggest that it's just the time of day sometimes when you come. Um, some water sometimes can be helpful. And I know some people have used some talcum powder as well, and that will bring it up. But please never use sandblasting, never use anything rough on that because that will destroy the stone itself. So walking around Kaloran, it's a wonderful history lesson to see so many of the, the names and so much of the history that is there. For more recent, uh, from 2006, this wonderful website, rip.ie, has, um, again, Balagar connections, and it's quite easy to filter that. And you just hit search by filtering the county and the town and the dates. So we'll give you from 2006, so up to today. Goa Bay FM also has its death notices, which is another way to find out about family connections and Midwest Radio likewise will do for present day families. For older uh, family members, one of the great things in Ireland is the memorial cards. So these are for my grandfather, Patrick Curley, who died on the 9th of March, 1957, and for his cousin, uh, Michael Curley, who died 10th of October, 1952. And many houses will have retained these memorial cards. And again, it's a wonderful way to find family history. So please have a look around and take a picture because you don't need to take it from anyone. You can take a picture and to share that within your family group and to find out how exactly people were related. Another website, irishgraveyards.ie, is fantastic in terms of the wider Galway County. Um, not all graves in the county are recorded. It's a commercial organization, so not everything is recorded, but it might help if you have ancestry in different places. And also historicgraves.com. Um, these graveyards are here 
in that league and Rahara are the closest ones that are recorded in our area. So you might have family there. But again, the best one is to go to the Galway County Council for the one at Ballygar Church and then the one just at Kiloran to go to itself or find a grave. The church records in Ballygar are quite old. It's one of the oldest um, recorded uh, baptismal and marriage and death records in East Galway. So it's a wonderful treasure. And they're available in different resources. Um, they go back, the baptisms go back to 1804. You have marriages starting at the same time. So these people getting married, they're in their 20s and their 30s. So they're born in the 1780s and 1770s. And you also have burials going back to 1804 as well. So unfortunately with burials, it doesn't quite tell us who they're connected to. Um, if you find a name that comes down through your family and in the burial records, it's going to be recorded as where they were from, it can be quite helpful. So these are available in, in different places in Ancestry and Find My Past, which are both subscription sites and also on Roots Ireland, which is available uh, from the East Galway Family History Society. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Also in Ballygar, Father Michael in the parish, if you make an appointment, um, well, it post COVID obviously, um, you will be able to look up these parish records that are being digitized and they're in the parish and they're available. So any record that's over a hundred years old is um, not covered by the GDPR and the records should be available. Again, it, it's a matter of appointment and a matter of availability of a person there. So it'd be a good thing to check with the parish and with Father Michael to see availability of that, those records. The records um, are also available for free on the Catholic parish registers at the National Library of Ireland. Uh, the website is registers.nli.ie. And there you just zoom in on the map and it will take you to the parish. Now the parish is down as Killine and it gives the variant forms the parish as Killoran. So Killine would be more of the Newbridge section and Killoran obviously the Ballygar section. And again, you can go in there to see the actual record from 1804 on. And those records were photographed back in the 1950s by the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And they were brought to Utah, to Salt Lake City, and they're turned into microfiche and presented to the National Library of Ireland as well. And just in the last few years, the National Library of Ireland has made those available for free. It would be a matter of squinting through some of them because unfortunately the writing is not the best. So this is one of the examples and you can filter it by the baptism, marriage or death, and also by the year. So that is quite a neat thing. So if you know that some of your family were baptized in the 1820s or 1830s, you'll be able to just narrow it down that way. This is what it looks like. And this is the death records from 1812. So you can see here that Patrick Connolly uh, from Gunnoge was one of those recorded as having died. And then you have Catherine Coughlin from Tully and you have William, it looks like, Noon from Lisquell, and you also have a Sarah Lohan from Balaclay. And again, it's the, the way that it's spelt and the handwriting to try and, and to figure that out and to, to make sure that you know where your family was from. So this looks like Tarmony here, and you have also other uh, bits of information on the side as well from the different parishes. So it's divided into Killine and also into Killoran. So the priest was making a record of that back just over 200 
and nine years ago. These are marriages from the same year. And again, you have the two people getting married and you've got Patrick Murray marrying a Bridget Lohan here. And it looks like a Thomas um, might be a Garrity marrying a Mariah Boyle here. And you have a Dominic Garrity here. So it, the handwriting could be a bit difficult sometimes to read. So be a matter of just looking at what other names are on. And you have Egan here and you have Lohan and you have Murray and you have Crehan and Tullys. So those are all names. So it's a matter of then trying to see exactly what is the name that's recorded on the particular one that you want to look at. Another way that you can find it is through the East Galway Family History Society, which is available through Roots Island. And you can get a month subscription or a year subscription. And to it's a well worth it to if you have a number of people that you want to trace. And when you look at the way that they get their records, you can just go straight into the Ballygar one. You can put in the surname, um, or the father's surname, mother's surname, sponsors even. So it's quite a neat way to find extended family. As we know at that time, if you were a sponsor, most likely you were a family member. So to find sponsors of people with your surname and to see who they were sponsoring might mean that you could find a tie to another branch of the family. So I did this with the, the surname Curly, which also is in Ballygar. And I want to see with the name Lohan, because the Lohans and the Curleys were married or intermarried there. So it comes up with Catherine Curley, who is the daughter of Martin Curley and Mariah Devine and Matthew Lohan is the sponsor there. So this is on the 16th of May, 1848, during the Great Hunger. So a very, very tough time for the family, but they went to the church and they had Catherine baptized on that date. And with the sponsor's name, you can see that there's probably a definite connection here. So this must be a cousin of some sort, Mariah and Mariah. And then Martin and Matthew are possibly related as well. Again, further investigation, we'll find that out. The great thing about Ballygard church records is the fact that the priests from time to time, also with the marriage records, put in the mother's maiden name. And this is a fantastic resource because this is not in many parishes. Um, a lot of times you'll also see, unfortunately, in Ballygar, you'll see just the, the husband and wife, and you won't see even the father's name. You will see those who are the sponsors, but from time to time, this amazing information is given. So Patrick Lohan and Ellen Mannion, their daughter, Mary Lohan from Kirklaw, was married in 1868 to Patrick and Anne Mitchell's um, son, John Fitzmaurice. So these are neighbors that are getting married and it's amazing to see all of that information there. So with the marriage records, you can also look then to see the mother's surname to see if there's any family. And I just put in this just to, to see with the Lohan, with a mother's name as Lohan as well. And there's a few of them that come up. So Michael Lohan from Lisquill in 1866, his parents were both Lohans, John Lohan and Ellen Lohan. And he married Mary Hines. She was from Lisquill as well. And her parents were Timothy Hines and Mary Noon. And because the name Lohan is so common in the area, the chances of them being related is, is quite large in one way, but it's probably an extended cousin, maybe third, fourth or fifth cousin that there would be because there's so many Lohans in the area. So those are on Roots Island. And also Ancestry has got a parish registers. So again, this is Bridget Lohan in 1807. So I just looked for anyone born plus or minus five years from 1812 in Ballygar to see who would come up. 
and these people here would all be from the Ballet Guard registry because no other um, place hardly in the county has got this and especially in the east of the county so Ballet Guard is quite unique in that. These are also uh, available in Find My Past. I put in Clark here and again just the the location is Kaline here, you can see, and also across the border, you can see in that league that you also have some registers from that particular time. And it's important to stretch across the border as well, because Ballygar, at the time, um, you're coming from that league, you're coming from Mount Talbot. So the border would not be an issue for people in getting married or in moving house. The other um, great search site is familysearch.org, but unfortunately it doesn't seem to have any of these um, listed at that time. It has various other um, information that is quite helpful, but it just doesn't have the, the baptismals, the church records from that time. So I'll just move on then to civil or the government records. So as I said, with the baptismal records, um, the church goes back to the early 1800s. With the civil records, it's much um, later on. Marriage um, was supposed to be recorded for everybody from 1845 on, but there was a, a problem with the Catholic hierarchy with the law, and so therefore Catholic marriages were not registered. By 1864, they had cleared that up, and then they had got old births, marriages, and deaths were supposed to be recorded. Now, up to 1900, um, the, the majority of people would have been recorded, but there was still 10, 15% of people that may not have been recorded. And where did they go to record? They went to the local poor law union. And in the case of Ballet Guard, that would have been Mount Bellew. If you went across the river, you would have gone to Roscommon and just further north, you'd have been registered in Glenamadi. But Mount Bellew will be the main place where people from Ballygar will have been recorded. Obviously um, with marriages, uh, if it's a wife who is from a different area, it's going to be recorded in the wife's home parish. So therefore, if the wife is from Atleek, um, the marriage will be recorded in Roscommon rather than Mount Bellew. And those records are free to view um, up to 100 years ago for birth records, up to 75 years ago for marriage records, and up to 50 years for death records. And they're available to view on civilrecords.irishgenealogy.ie. So using those and using the civil registration district of Mount Bellew, I just want to, again, the, the name Lohan, to just put it in and just to see what the results are. So there's 977 results broken down to 498 births, 310 deaths, and 169 marriages. And you can sort them by date. You can have them in tens, fifties, or hundreds. I would advise a hundreds. That way you have less pages to go through. And you can also sort them down by the century. So you can see here in the 1800s, this 454, 1900s, 523. So it just means that from 1864 on, you're able to track some of the family. So what's available in these records? When you go to the um, marriage records, you're going to find the churches recorded where they were married. You also find the date that they were married on the name of the couple, whether or not they were over 21, full age, whether they were married before, so a bachelor or a spinster, widow or a widower, the occupation usually of the male. Unfortunately, the female's occupation is sometimes not listed. The townland that they're from, so Thomas Lohan here, some Lisquell, he's getting married to Kathleen Lohan and she's some Clunkeen. The father's name is listed, sadly, not the mother's name. Luke Lohan is Thomas's dad. Matthew Lohan is Kathleen's dad. 
and their occupation. So a farmer's son marrying a farmer's daughter. And then you also have the signatures of the two people. And you can see here, this marriage is somewhere, and both of them signed the record. And then it tells you who were the witnesses, the best man, John Fallon. So quite possibly a connection um, to, to Thomas Lohan and Bridget Lohan, and quite possibly a connection to Kathleen Lohan. So sometimes it would be siblings or cousins or neighbors that would have been the ones who were there. So all of that will give us clues to family connections. The priest, it turns out to be a father Lohan as well. As I said, it's a great strong name in the area. And then just on the next one, so on each page, there'll be four marriages. So you have Luke Lohan from Newbridge getting married to Nora Farrell from Lisquell. And again, both parents are recorded. And as you go further down the page, you'll see more of those records. So those are the marriage records. And then we'll have also the birth records. And in this case, it's from 1913. So you have Margaret Connolly, and she's from Mucklin, and she, her mother is Mary Connolly, and she's formerly Kilcommons. And this is the great thing about the birth records because it gives the mother's maiden name. So Mary Brannelly, Nee Martin, and Maggie Connolly, Nee Ward. And this family is from Kappa, this family is from Rouen, and it gives the names of the children. So the birth records give an amazing amount of information, especially from the 1860s on, because unfortunately, sometimes you don't find the marriage records, but you do find with the birth records. So using this with the baptismal records, you should be able to make good headway in your family history. The death records as well are quite interesting. And one of the things about the death records, when you look here at Mary Kenny, she's a widow of 68 years. It's 1872. So therefore, she was born in 1804, approximately, and she lives in Taikuli. So her baptismal register would not be there. Quite possibly, her marriage record wouldn't be there. But we're able to, to figure out possibly who she is by that. And it tells us that the mark of Pat Keeley who was present at death in Tai Cooley. So this is 1872. So if you look at who were the families in Tai Cooley in, in the 1901 census or the 1855 Griffiths valuation, you might be able to make headway into finding out who Mary Kinney was related to. Patrick Scarry is another person here Okay, he's from Beach Lawn. He's only 10 months old, sadly. And the person who is present at death is Pat Scarry. So he has come in and he talks about how he had convulsions 16 weeks and there was no medical attendant. But sadly, the young boy had passed away. So sometimes you'll find that as well that you will have great aunts and great uncles that sometimes are not mentioned anywhere, but they will come up there in the death records. So all of those are available at civilrecords.irishgenealogy.ie. Sometimes the records themselves are not available, but transcriptions are. So in this case, Bridget Lohan, and um, she was born in 1913, and her mother's name is recorded there as Ellen Lohan and the birth name was Martin. So John Lohan married Ellen Martin and they had a daughter Bridget on the 3rd of May, 1913. But for some reason, it's not available online yet. Um, some of those records will be available. The ones that are not available online can be accessed through the government record office in Roscommon and you can call them as well and you can book an appointment or you can do it by email. So that's the Government Record Office, Roscommon. If you Google it, you will get the information on that. Now we just turn to the census records. So those are individuals. So it's recording of whole families. And the census records, the default is 1911, 
when you come on to the record itself. And you can search by surname, you can search by county, our DED, which is District Electoral Divisions. So when the poor law unions were set up in the 1830s, a group of villages, townlands were put together in these district electoral divisions in order to have elected a uh, person to the Board of Guardians. And we still use them today in terms of the elections. The census years um, were from 1821 right up to 1911, but sadly for various reasons, um, especially the 61, 71, 81 and 91 records were destroyed. And then in the start of the Civil War in 1923, the 41 and 51 records were also destroyed. So we are kind of like left with the full records of 1911, 1921, with some parishes in Galway having some of the 1821 records. With those records, we can find out a great deal. For instance, in the DED, for our area here would be Killoran, and this is the 91, 1901 census, and you see the various townlands going down. And normally you would think when you hit Ballygard that you should be able to find Ballygard town, and you'd be surprised there's only four houses in Ballygard according to the census of 1901, but it was just an error in transcription because they're actually in this and then Kaline Barony. So the person who was typing up the 1901 census um, omitted the townland and put in Kaline Barony for some reason, but it should be Ballygar Town. And you can see some of the names there. And again, you'll find that sometimes there's transcription errors. So if you can find your family, it might be an idea to go and browse through it and to look up 1901, Galway, Killoran, Killine, and then just scroll down through the names and see if there's something that might be possibly, for instance, Maguire, that you click on the occupants and what comes up is who was in the house at the time. So I'm just picking this family here because it's well known, Ballygar named the Pettits. So you have John, his wife, Dora, and their family. And also you've got Andrew, who's a shop assistant, and Mary, who's a general servant domestic. And as you can see here, John Pettit has just arrived from County Mayo. He's got a daughter, Mary, who's just been born. She's a few months old, and she was born in County Mayo. And one of the things that you can do with this is to have a search on the civil records for a family um, in the birth records. I would go for someone like Dora because it's an unusual name just to see what is the surname of Dora, the mother. So John and Dora here, John is from Galway. He's married Dora, she's in Roscommon. And when you see this is the actual form that they filled out. So you've got the whole family here. And you can see that F-E-N-N -N should actually have been F-I-N-N. -N. So again, it's the person who is transcribing it, has put it down as something different. And this name here, it looks like Maguire, M-A-G-U-I-R-E. And it's based upon the person's handwriting. So you have all of these little tads of information. The Irish language here, John was able to speak it, sadly. English has become the dominant tongue. So that's going to be another part of the social history that the Irish language is going to be dying out. And with it as well, you have people having surnames written down in, in various forms because they were originally Irish speaking. And when they were being transcribed down, it was into English language documents like these. The census also tells us the house and building returns for the whole area. So not just the Pettits, but everybody else. So here is John Pettit here, and we can see that he has a public house. We can see that he had four buildings out the back, and we can see Thomas McDonald here with a staggering 17 buildings out the back. So he's got a shop 
as well. So there's lots of information about the families and their living conditions. The walls, one means that it was made of stone, zero on the roof means it was thatched, but the rest were slated houses. And then it tells you how many windows were in the front. So the McDonald's again, impressive with 15 windows in the front, lots of washing to do at springtime. And then it tells us here that they have 19 rooms, but there's 13 people living there. The interesting thing about it is that all of the people own their own houses. So while the Kellys had been the ones who had built the town and had rented it out at this stage, the Baggots had come in in the 1860s and with the reforms of the, the Land Acts and with the Land Commission and various other things going on in the 1880s, 1890s, it's going from rented to being owners. So that is the house and building return and you can find lots of information and kind of conjure up a picture of what it was like. But one of the great things about Balagar is that most of these buildings are still in situ. So you're gonna be able to walk around and see that actual building. They also have what were the out offices. So we can see here that the McDonald's had three stables, that a coach house, a harness house, a cow house, a dairy, a piggery, a fowl house, and that four stores. So that made up for those 17 buildings that we saw before. So again, having a look to where the McDonald's lived and having a look at the back will be able to show us the extent of their property. So all of those are highlighted right across the board on that house and building return. So it's a great way to look at your family history and to find out what extent that they were surviving or flourishing or just about getting on back in 1901. I have to just mention Patrick Digby French here, that's recorded in the census of house number two, it's Church of Ireland, born in Galway. And he's a general, he's the medical doctor and he's taken over from his father. And this um, piece of um, newspaper article I saw in Ballygar Banter, and it's reported Ballygar Dispensary for 1847. And it talks about how conditions were really bad. Last winter, spring, the months of May and June, diarrhea and dysentery had first attacked the poor. In their advanced stages, they were attended with general and asuria and great debility. So the suffering that the poor, especially around the area, had during the Great Hunger is laid out in great detail there by Dr. French and his son, Patrick Digby French, or sorry, Digby Patrick French rather takes over that and is the medical practitioner in Ballygar up until the 1920s. So as I said, trying to find out the names of the families is, is quite interesting. And to see the, the wife's maiden name is not recorded on the census, but if you look up one of her children, in this case, I went to look to see Dora Pettit, and I found that there was other Dora Pettits around, but the one that is most likely is ours is 15 October 1899, Dora Pettit. She's born in Claire Morris, which would be the right because she's born in County Mio, and her mother is recorded as McConville. So by clicking on the image, we'll be able to see Dora here, and her father is John Pettit. They live in Bowie Harness. And he's a draper. So there's a little bit of social history in terms of John Pettit coming into Ballygar at this time. He's married a Dora McConville and their daughter, the last daughter, 15th of October, 1899. The census was taken in April 1901. So she would have been a year and a half at that stage. And it's a nice way to find when families came to an area to see where some of the, the children were born. Again, have these recorded, make sure that you put all the information down as you find it. And then later on, you can edit it at your leisure. The other census records that come out in 1908, a bill was passed to give the pension to those aged over 70. And to apply for it, you had to say, 
where you would be recorded in the um, the, in the 1851 or 1841 census. Now, I had a quick look to see who would be eligible approximately at this time um, through the 1911 census to see who was aged over 90 and who was aged over 80 in this. So there was a number of people, Bridget Kelly would be the oldest in the town and she was um, the head of her family and Anne Hessian was a mother-in-law at age 90. So it's interesting to, to just search the census for the oldest in the area. There was others as well who were aged over 70 at that time. I got these from 74 on up. So Celia Connor, Mary Fitzgerald, Anne Clark, Sarah Nolan, Mary Ford, lots of women, not too much men met it. So what you had to do then is apply to the pension and you would send off the application up to Dublin and say what year that you would be recorded on the census and what the name would have been on the census and who your parents were. And again, this is a fantastic way to find sometimes people who have never recorded in anything else, the census search forms. Unfortunately, not everyone lived and those who did, not everyone applied. But if your family applied, you'll be able to find an amazing amount of information. So that's Michael McDonald there, um, who had just seen. So he's one of the preeminent people in Ballygar, and he's helping out the family of Michael Fitzmorris. And you can see also that Michael J. Fitzmorris has also applied, and you can see where the family was in Boston. So I'm going to go down to Catherine Huvier here who was formerly Catherine Mangan, and she says that her father was Martin or John. So it could be somebody in the family that's, that's applying for her. She might be older. Her memory might not be the best. So she applies. It gives us the address she's at present, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. And it says, look at the 1851 census that she was born around 1845 to 47. It was sent in 1917. So trying to find that, the civil servant would have gone and would have looked around and tried to find it and say whether she was there or not. And it seems that not found was going to be the issue. So don't know what happened, but quite possibly her pension application was turned down. But again, there's lots of information on that and it might be that your great grandfather may not have lived that length but his sister might have or their cousin might have and it would be a matter to to look up those pension application forms the next place to look at and unfortunately there's not too much available in terms here um, is is the school records um, the school records are going to be kept within the school themselves and um, many of the schools don't have records going back to the foundation. If they did, it would have been a wonderful resource. This is Trehill National School, one of the first in the area. Um, this is from the, the Logan collection. Um, the Logans of Trihill had gone to America, their name had been changed, and they came back in 1901 approximately um, to visit the family and to see the old places around and take pictures of them. And some of you will be very familiar with the name because if you're especially in Boston, the name of the airport there, Logan Airport is after General Edward Logan, whose family were the Logans of Trihill and who had actually gone to that school. This is the site of Babahali Church the, the students planted daffodils back in 2019 to show where the church used to be. And the school would have been a part of the church until it got knocked down. And 125 years ago this year, the, the new school was built. And this is a lovely picture that David Lowen had of his mother and her classmates in approximately 1948, just outside the school. Again, there are some class pictures around that might be helpful for identifying in terms of family connections. 
but also if you could get a chance to see what's available in the school records. And some schools from time to time do have a history day or a heritage day where these records are available to have a look at. One of the fascinating places to go to is, is the website doohist.ie and it has the schools collection. And what this was in the, the 1930s, uh, the Folklore Commission asked all the principals in all the schools to have the children find stories about their area, to find information, um, some local knowledge, to write it down. And because of that, we have a tremendous resource. Um, many of the schools in the area did write them down. This, this one here was written down about that old church in Balalwe. And it was from there that I was able to find out how um, long and how wide it was. And, and therefore we were able to, to measure that out with the young people of the school and to plant the daffodils in that. But sometimes you might find as well that your great grandparents' stories are recorded there and they might talk about other family members. I know in, in one school, uh, one family talked about where their family had come from three generations before. So there's lots and lots of interesting information there on doohas.ie. Three schools in the parish at present um, are great resources. Again, um, to just get in contact, um, I've worked with all three on local history projects and family history projects. The students are very keen the resources sometimes um, are, don't go back that far, but what is there, the three principals are amazingly helpful in, in doing that and the secretaries within the schools as well. So again, those are some of the resources within the school. This is the, the wonderful school in Trehill with the cross just above the beautiful door. So that goes back to approximately 1830 when it was built. Wonderful two-story school, which is most unusual. Military records. Um, the military archives have wonderful records on local um, history from the, the time of the war independence and on. So militaryarchives.ie, you will find some fascinating reports there. The census collection of 1922, the army collected uh, information about who was in the army at that time. So it's a wonderful resource to find if any of your family served in the, the national army at the time. And also the Bureau of Military History, what happened there is that um, they, they went out and asked information of people and get their stories about what was going on in the area. So you may not have your per own person making a contribution, but they could have been spoken of. And sometimes you also find that people got pensions uh, because of their activity. And the pensions collection, again, is wonderful to search through to find out if there's anyone in your family or neighbors that were um, collecting a pension because of their activity from 1916 or 1921 to 23. The brigade activity reports tell also about what was happening in Ballygar at the time. And also you have got this Bureau of Military History where, as I said, if you search just for Ballygar, you'll find Seamus Bevan, for instance, um, who came to Ballygar as a teacher and Seamus gave his account of what was going on in Dublin in 1916, because as a young boy, he was involved there. And then we have got Thomas Kelly from Roscommon talking about the volunteer units in Ballygar and what was going on. Brian Lennon is, is mentioned there in the Ballygar company. Sean O'Neill was from Dunmore and mentions also Ballygar. And he talks about who was in the companies as well. So these men here, uh, Paul had shared that picture in his Mount Talbot page. So it's a matter of identifying from the military and some of the stories and obviously as well looking at the stories of the women who are there helping and supporting in common Namon as well. Newspapers are another great source. I'll just mention briefly to um, the Irish newspaper archives 
which um, both of these, the, the British newspaper archives and the Irish newspaper archives are both um, subscription based, unfortunately. You also have an Australian one, Trove, which is free and which sometimes would mention Ballygar. The Irish newspaper archives, great thing about it is you can search back to 200 years back to find what was some of the events that were happening that would have affected your own family. So I was looking here, I talked about Ballygar and they were talking about setting up um, an effort to, to loan out funds, small funds to individual people. And we'll come to that in a few moments. But on the other side, it talks about the infamous corn laws. So while this is talking about Ballygar here, um, this is gonna be talking about what's going to affect Ireland in a few short years. So 20 years on the corn laws and Robert Peel and, and the repeal of the corn laws, which led to the collapse of his government and then the infamous um, new government, which kind of like left Ireland to, to suffer the great hunger. So this one is from the British Library. So it's from the, the British newspaper archives and it goes back a little bit further. Pew's Occurrences is one of the newspapers it has and it talks about the lands of Ballygar containing 125 acres and how they're going to be rented out. So that is quite a, a, a long ways back in terms of your family history, just to see you may not have any names there, but you'll have an idea of what was going on around the area. So it mentions there to write to John Kelly in Clune Line or Mr. James Kelly at Fairfield. So the Kelly family there very much connected. And it talks here in 1840, just before the great hunger that the parish priest of Ballygar was, um, he had passed away, so Father Kine. So, there's all sorts of information that you can find in the newspaper archives. Later on in the late 1880s, early 1890s, 1900s, you're gonna find very specific information about your family, most likely with names of people being involved in the land league, being involved in disputes with the landlord, possibly over tenant rights. And sometimes that would end up in court and the court cases as well would be another valuable place to look at. This is talking about from 1840, about Ballygar as one of the rising market towns. So it's just 20 years being built. It's just before the Great Hunger, the, um, the flour mill that's going to be less um, is, is going to be there. And it's going to have that mention of, of Ballygar and Mount Bellia Bridge as one of the, the places to search for would be that British newspaper archives or the Irish news archives as well. We're moving on now to the Griffiths valuation from the mid 1850s. And the Griffiths valuation was done by this man here, Richard Griffith. And he was a surveyor and he was also responsible for the ordnance survey maps. And this is uh, from 1st of June, 1837. And it talks about, they have maps now, Killorn and the townlands in the parish. And if anyone wants to make an adjustment, they have until the 6th day of June of 1837 to make an adjustment. So they just have one week. So this is the person then, he has done these maps. He said, this is the townland of, of Ballygar. So this is Tully Row. So he's given the boundaries of all of them if you want to make an adjustment, but he's gonna use those maps now to find out the valuation uh, for the taxation. And what he's going to do is he's going to name who's the person that's in occupancy of it, who they are renting from. In this case, it's Dennis Kelly. In fee means that he has ownership himself. And then you have the various different people, Martin Smith, and they're renting from Dennis Kelly all the way down. The amazing thing about this is the fact that you also have maps to accompany this. So the town of Ballygar, for instance, has a map of itself and you can follow along the numbers as well as the town lens around and who was that. So Reverend Edward Wallace is renting 21 acres. He's got a house and buildings worth six pounds, 10 shillings. 
and the land that he has is worth 10 pounds, 10 shillings, the valuation of it. So the rent will be based upon that evaluation. And then you have the Reverend John Hopkins, who's got a house and garden, who's got just 37 roots, or sorry, 37 purchase. So um, he doesn't have too much. Um, and it's only worth there. The land is only worth five shillings, but his house is substantial. It's worth five pound and 15 shillings. So this is the, the map that accompanies the, um, the Griffiths valuation. And the map itself has these red, so it's, it's based upon the ordnance survey map that Richard Griffiths had already completed. So the thick red lines is the boundary of the townland. The townland is here as in the ordnance survey map, but then he's divided the segments up and giving them numbers. So each of the numbers then corresponds to what we had seen on this information. So you're able then to say in Ballygar, for instance, here, he's going to make a more complete map. So he's also going to number it. So you can see here, he starts at 20, 21, 22, goes around the square, comes back around, and then goes up onto the Montbellier Road. And by using both of those, we're able then to see who was who. So for instance, if we look at the dispensary here, it's number 23. So here's the dispensary at number 23 and loan office. And then number 24 is going to be the constabulary force. Philip Heavey is at number 25. Number 26 is Thomas Gaffney. 27 and 28 are Downers Lodgers. 29 is Timothy Kennedy. And Owen Fitzmaurice then is going to own this substantial property here. The great thing about that is that you can walk around that with that map and to see those buildings still in situ today and who owned what. Mr. Kelly, as I said, was the landlord. He was not the only landlord around in the area. This wonderful map by the landed estates database of the NUI Galway has these little green dots here, which is the landlord's houses. So you have the Talbots here in Mount Talbot. So here's Dennis Kelly. You have the Cheevers here in Killine. You also have the, um, the Nettervilles. And here you have recorded Ocarine Castle or Castle Kelly, the old castle. You can see the turrets of it here and then the substantial building all now sadly not. And that was knocked in 1919. So this was where the O'Kellys had been since the 1500s. So Dennis Kelly was there. He had sold it out in 1863. And the Baggots, whose name is in Baggot Street in Dublin, had bought it and then sold it on to the Department of Agriculture in 1910. In the archives, there's a lot of information that quite possibly will be helpful because when he's giving his family lands or deeds, um, there might be mention of some of the families that were local to the area. You also have maps of different townlands like Lichin Taig and Tully Row. And you also have um, possibly information there that could be of rentals. So one of the, the kind of like good resources that's kind of hidden away, unfortunately, in National Library or in sometimes, I know um, in Manchester, they have Dennis Kelly's library as well, that you have restricted access. You have to be actually in a place. It's not digitized yet. So hopefully in time that will come available. One of the things that is available and it's on Find My Past and Ancestry is the rental and particulars of the, the Kelly estate when it did get sold in 1863. And it describes all the townlands, who is renting there. So this is something that's helpful now from the 1855 Griffiths valuation on, that you'll be able to see who the families are. In this case, here's the widow Nolan. Um, she is renting, and it tells you how much she is renting, six acres, one root and 36 purchase, and how much the yearly rent is, two pounds, six shillings and two pence. 
and it's due on the Gale days, 1st of May and 1st of November. And it's tenant from year to year. And many of the tenants from the 1840s, 50s onward tenants from year to year. Back in the 1790s, 1800s, you would have tenancies for an agreed amount of years, possibly about 30 years, or sometimes for lives of certain people. But with the 1816 20 depression and the, um, the landlords, then, especially with the collapse of the French bank in uh, Chum, many landlords found themselves under the kibosh and they started to rent out just on a yearly basis so that way they could get rid of their tenants quite quickly if they needed to turn the lands into grazing as Mrs. Gerard did in Ballinlass just out the road in 1846. So you have lots of information in this um, clean line Patrick Norton or Nocton would have been renting and again it tells us that he's renting 40 acres and he's got a lease from 1861 for 10 years. So it's quite unusual to have that. But again, he's renting quite an amount of land. So those who were in dire difficulties in the 1830s and early 1840s found a little bit of help from the loan funds. And especially in Ballet Guard, this was set up, as you saw on the map before, it says dispensary and loan office. And the loan funds were designed to help people with some money to get them to buy land, microfinancing, we would call it today. But in 1850, they were asked, what has happened to all of those loans? And I'm indebted to Emily Connolly for transcribing many of these. We've put them up on the, the Ballet Guard DNA group, and she has transcribed many of them. So this is the townland of New Caloran, and you have Peter Queenie, on the 4th of December, 1845, he's present there. He's also present in 1847. Um, it says that he is very poor. He's now at Ballygar and he's a pauper. But you have Michael Morden, who is given the loan in 1845 and he's a poor man. And he went to America in 1849. Seamus, uh, James Queenie, in 1845, he, he's there, a very poor man. He left this townland in 1850. And you have Pat Nolan, again, a poor man, went to America. Thomas Egan, or, or Tom Egan, 1846. He was in middling circumstances, and he died in 1850. And Thomas Heavey, in, he was there in, in November of 1846, a very poor man now resides in Ballygar in the immediate vicinity. There's a poor man, lives by labor. So there's an amazing amount of information that's available in, in terms of the loan funds. Again, these are available on Find My Past and also on Ancestry. And we have highlighted them in the, um, the, the Ballygar DNA group as well. The valuation office books around this time too, Again, this is a part of Richard Griffith's valuation. Um, this was done a little bit earlier in 1844. So again, you have John McDonald here. So Pat Gilmer, you have Feeney's and Fitzmaurice's and Clark's and Gunnings and Martin's and Kirkwood. All of these names are very familiar to people in the area. But when you go into them, it tells you how much they had. Um, they had a public house, for instance, Bernard Gilmer, with some stabling, tells you the valuation of it, valuation of the house, tells you how long the house was, how high the house was. So it's amazing little bit of information there. But for family history purposes, it possibly gives you the name of an ancestor that continues down in terms of names. So you have Robert Connor, Bartholomew Feeney, Bernard Gilmer, names that are very much there. And if you go to Killoran Graveyard, you will possibly find their graves there as well. And as you know, the 1840s, Ireland got hit by Ungertha Moore, the Great Hunger, where the potato crop had failed several times. British government first had come in to help and then had decided to let things be and 
with the disastrous results of almost 2 million dead, another 2 million immigrating within a short period of time. And we can see from the 1851 census returns what the effect had on the local area. Um, Castle Kelly itself, there was four, that would be Dennis Kelly's household, there's only four there. Um, he's got nine. Ballinlass, which is near Ballinmore Bridge, had 72, there was still 72. Ballinvoher North had 64, now 47, so it got um, down by 20, by 17. Ballinvoher South, 90 to 75, down by 15. Ballygar, 23 to 25, that's the townland. And you're going down. So some townlands weren't affected, and some like Clean Line was disastrous. 217, now you have only 124. Where it gets you is where the number of houses. So the number of houses in 1841 was 33 in Clean Line, now it's 21. So 12 families have disappeared. In Karen Trail, 11, now it's down to 10. 15 in Balavohar, now it's 14. So Balanlas seems to, the other Balanlas has gone up in terms of number of houses. So this continues down and it's interesting to go through this. This is available online through the University of Southampton and um, their uh, DIPAM website, D-I-P-P-A-M website. And it shows, for instance, some townlands uh, population 91 in Drynan has gone up to 171. Population in Curraboy from 36 to 31. Population in Gurkhusen 104 to 77. Hermitage 112 to 104. Killorn itself 632 to 438. And Kilmore 316 has gone up to 366. So the old townland of Killorn was quite heavily populated in 1841 and its population has gone down by almost 200 in that short space of time. The guard town itself, 333, and now it's 460. It had 61 houses in 1841. It's now got 83, 17 of them are unoccupied, 65 are occupied. So it's, it's gone from 52 occupied to 65 occupied houses. And you can see the population itself has gone down in the whole parish from 5,162 to 3,651. So a population drop of 1,500, which is quite a substantial amount. And the number of houses, again, the populated houses were 828, and that's gone down to 611. So all of this information um, shows us that some parts got hit really hard by Angartha Moor. And that led then to a loss of population that continued right up to the 1950s, 1960s. And Ireland's population still, as you know, is not recovered fully since Angartha Moor. The final piece of records here in terms of the 19th century that I want to touch on briefly are the tithe records from the 18th in Killorn. These tithe records were monies paid to the Church of Ireland minister. And this led to quite a lot of conflict and eventually it led to the abolition of the tithes and the introduction, excuse me, of the rates, which led to Griffith's valuation for them. But the tithes tell us who were the people who were having tillage in the 1820s and 1830s. And again, it could help with one more generation of your family tree. Um, D.H. Kelly would be the landlord. Um, it, it tells us the information here. D.H. Kelly in Ballygar Esquire is going to be, and Hugh Gilmer, Edmund Clark, um, Mark Donovan, and John Wall. So some names there, the Clark, Gilmer, and Wall names continue right throughout. So these are the early occupants of the, the town of Ballygar at the time. So it's interesting, it tells you how much tillage that they had, what it was worth, and then the tithe would be a percentage of that that would be due to the Church of Ireland because that was the official church 
of the country at the time up to 1871. Now, what happened to many people from the 1840s on as a result of the Great Hunger? Um, we, we have some immigration records that are quite detailed uh, because of Ellis Island. And when Ellis Island opened its doors in 1891, as you know, the first person to cross the threshold was Annie Moore from Ireland, a girl of 15 years, according to the song. But there were more 15 year olds and 18 year olds and 20 year old girls and boys from Ballygar that crossed that threshold as well. And thankfully, um, we can find out who they are because the records are there. So you have Bridget Brennan, who was 18. We have Mary Brennan, who was 16. We have Annie Brandon, who was 17, among the youngest of the Ballet Gar immigrants, several hundred of them. And this is available from stevemores.org, where you can actually search by the townland. And it tells you what year that they immigrated in. And then by calculating back from their age, it gives us the approximate year that they were born. And it gives us access then to the immigration records from the Ellis Island Foundation. So you can go through that list and see some of the family. The great thing about the records when they come is that the, the person has to identify where they were coming after 1904, where they were coming from and who they were going to. So that can give us lots of information. I picked one of the records there on, on the list um, and it tells us that the record is on line five and when we go to line five Casey Coleman not Hattie as the transcribed was her name is crossed out so possibly she didn't make that voyage herself but her record is there to tell us a little bit about her um, and it says where where she's coming from. So her brother was Martin Coleman in Ballygar. So it's telling us who she's leaving in Ballygar. And then the second page, so she's on line five, again, the cross dad, who she's going to. And she's going to her cousin, who's Lawrence Connolly, and he lives in New York. So this bit of information can be quite helpful for people because Lawrence Connolly might have been American born, he might have been Ballygar born, and it would be a matter of, of trying to trace how is he related to, um, to Katie. Maybe her mother is a Connolly, maybe his mother was a Coleman. Again, this is a part of your family tree that might be able to, to be worked out using these immigration records. Now, not everybody Obviously, and one of the other things I should add is that immigration records to other cities are available. Again, stevemores.org. They're available on Ancestry and also on Family Search and on Find My Past. So it's a good way, especially with immigration to the US or to Canada or to Australia. Immigration to England, because Ireland up until 1921 was a part of the UK, and it, it still doesn't really have too much paperwork to travel from Ireland to the UK. So therefore, it's much limited in terms of it went over to England first and then immigrated to America or stayed in England. Those records are not as available as the American records are. So how do we get around that? How do we get around the people who left from 1841 to 51 during the height of the Great Hunger? How do we get around the people who left a little bit later on? Well, that's where DNA comes in. Um, family records can be very good. I've seen people where they've kept connections with families, um, but many people could not read or write at that time. We do have great schools in Ballygar, so that wouldn't affect Ballygar people in the town because they could read and write. But for many people in the outlying places, possibly not. And where DNA comes in is that people taking a DNA test are able then to find the family connections. So what, it, what does DNA do? Um, we have 46 chromosomes. Um, they come in 23 pairs of chromosomes. They're inherited from our parents, both our father and our mother give us that. And they inherited likewise from theirs and they inherited likewise from theirs. 
those change slightly over the generations. So if you share a segment of DNA with a person, you are going to be getting that from a shared ancestor going back in the past. The more DNA that you share with the person, the closer relationship you are. So you obviously share more with your parents than with your sibling. You share more with your sibling than you would with a first cousin. You share more with the first cousin than you would share with the second cousin and so on. So what we have done is to try and use social media and especially Facebook to be a place, a platform where people who have done DNA tests are able to share who they're connected to and then connect them back to families in the area. And this came about because of great work um, that was done with the transition year students back in 2016. I have to give credit to Eamon Madden. Um, when I started working first with schools, Eamon was the first school to book me. And I'm really, really happy to have been working with the school since 2013. And this group of young people in 2016, we had done um, their family trees and we had asked them if they would be interested in having a family member do a DNA test. And courtesy of Ancestry, who donated 25 kits to us, we were able then to get the, both students and some of the staff who are local to the area to do that DNA test. And because of that, we were able to find an amazing amount of people in the diaspora. That led to further developments. One of the first people to get in touch, in fact, the first person to get in touch with me as a result of that was Pat Abernathy Murphy in Austin, Texas, whose family um, traced their lineage to a Bridget Lohan from Lisquell, who goes out during the Great Hunger. And because of the new batch of DNA matches that suddenly appeared in October of 2016 because of the, the students' uh, DNA results coming in, Pat was able to significantly um, add to her family history. And because of that, herself and some of her cousins, most notably David Lowen, have contributed much and they've actually set up a separate group called the Lowen Logan and Allied Families. And as you notice, that's the, the bridge going into trail and you have Lohan Central kind of like there with the, the family of, of Edward Logan of Boston Airport fame just around the corner. But we also, in 2019, as a part of the Galway Genetic Genealogy Conference that year, um, invited Pat to speak and then had a family gathering the next day that was very much organized by Pat Gilmore and others, including Hugh Lowen, um, in, in Hugh Mangan and other families in Ballygar, which was a great success. The, continuing from that, we also um, start to reach out to the wider area and especially in my area where family members um, had got their DNA. And as a result of that, people were becoming a part of the groups. So last May, um, we set up the East Galway Genealogy and DNA. So if anyone has any family contact at all or would like to learn a bit more about our area of the world, I'd invite you to join this East Galway Genealogy and DNA. My co-admin is, is Mighty Corcoran, who's based just outside Belclair in Chum. And what we're trying to do is to reach out to our diaspora and to tell the story of our area and invite people back. And it's so important now, especially for next year and, and the following years with what has happened with the tourism industry and local areas to invite people back to our area in rural East Galway to do that. But what we're trying to do especially is to reconnect people. And a few of the success stories, um, one of them in, in particular, it, it's come to, to mind is the, the story of the Cusack family from Kappa. And just recently, um, RTE put up this very interesting letter that was sent by Francis Cusack, who was a police officer in Kappa. And he wrote in June 8, 1846, to Mr. Comyon, who was the chief constable in Ballygar, about the distress in the area. 
and he talks about what was happening in previous years and how that's you know the people had remained kind of like quiet there were not civil disobedience or anything but now that the hunger in 1846 in june just at the start of the great hunger that it was pushing people to the limits and that he will be out of his power to prevent them from breaking through in order to afford themselves some substance to keep them from starvation so this letter is important because we're able to trace Francis Kappa to the actor family, the Cusacks of Chicago. And we're able to do that through DNA because Francis Kappa, Francis um, Cusack's great, great, great granddaughter had done a DNA test and had shared it. And through that, David Lohan had also worked on one of the, the Cusack sister, Teresa in Mississippi. And we we're able to show that they were a match and they were a match through the Cusick line. And we we're able to find that Francis Cusick's wife was Margaret Tracy. And she had gone out to her son, Dennis, who would be the, the Cusick's great grandfather who had opened a saloon in uh, New York City. And she had gone out after her husband, Francis died in 1877. One of the interesting things as well through RTE is the, the fact that they also had got some more information from that area, including a list of people from the villages that were appealing to the landlord, uh, Dennis Kelly, to try and get more um, work for them. And what the British government at the time had set up was uh, work schemes for the people. So that way they would be able to get money to buy the, the corn that was being imported because obviously their food had all gone. So it's a, it's a list of people in the different villages around the place and that's available through the RTE website. And you can see that the list goes on with all of these people and it's in their own handwriting it seems because the education level around the area through the different schools was quite high. So you have the, the school in um, in Trehill, you have the school in Ballygar, you have the school in Kappa, you have the school in um, Ballyclee, and those schools made sure of education. So you have the handwriting there of the people. So again, it's a great list for your family history. So I'm going to finish off there a little bit longer than I thought it might be. Um, I hope you have had enjoyed that kind of review of, of some of the places that you can go to. Um, I've omitted some, um, the, the uh, court system, for instance, you, you have the courts there. Again, you might find that your great, great granny and her neighbor were in conflict over a sheep or a cow or a chicken crossing the road and they brought it up into court. So there's great resources there. Or somebody in the family um, didn't pay their dog license so whatever your surname is in the area, I hope you had an opportunity to find that there are amazing records still available to find. And this is just a brief summary of the ones that I have um, gone through in this talk, civil records, the registers, the census, and in the nationalarchives.org as well, the genealogy section there, will have the, um, the, the pension records and it'll also have the valuation books. So when you go to census.nationalarchives.org, click on genealogy and you'll have the rest of them as well. So again, just as a finish to invite you to become a part, an active part of the East Galway Genealogy Group, um, just look it up on Facebook. And if you have low end connections, or any other connections to just post your information, tell us a little bit about your family. If you have done a DNA test to look at, see how we organize it through GEDmatch. And you also um, obviously please do a DNA test if you haven't done already. If you're in Ireland and you're like, oh, I know all my cousins. Yes, that is brilliant, but do a DNA test. So that way you're cousins in the diaspora who are trying desperately to find their connections will find you. Just as Pat phoned me from Austin, Texas to say how delighted she was 
to find so many new cousins that were connecting her back to Ballygar, back to Lisquell. The same could happen for you or for anyone else. So whether you're in Ballygar when it's a sunny day and it's not too busy, or whether you're in Ballygar when it's a fun day and you're all the way in to do things, and hopefully this will be next year and the year after and many, many more years, I enjoy every time I go to Ballygar. The people are amazing. The history is wonderful and great credit to everybody involved. And again, many, many thanks to Ballygar Carnival Committee for having me today. And I'm going to just switch back here to just the video panel to just go back up here to just say thank you again to everybody for having me and to wish the Carnival Committee every success this year and many, many years into the future. And Mula Bihas to everyone. So if you are not in Ballygar, please come soon. If you're in Ballygar, enjoy yourselves over the next few days. Slán agus God bless.